Chapter Twelve of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Twelve. New theory of Mr. Muddle, remarkable for having no end to it. Novel practice of Mr. Chucks. O'Brien commences his history i bring up the master's night-glass as i have already mentioned sufficient of the captain and the first lieutenant to enable the reader to gain an insight into their characters i shall now mention two very odd personages who were my shipmates the carpenter and the boatswain the carpenter whose name was muddle used to go by the appellation of philosopher chips not that he followed any particular school but had formed a theory of his own from which he was not to be dissuaded this was that the universe had its cycle of events which turned round so that in a certain period of time everything was to happen over again i never could make him explain upon what data his calculations were founded he said that if he explained it i was too young to comprehend it but the fact was this that in twenty seven thousand six hundred and seventy two years everything that was going on now would be going on again with the same people as were existing at this present time he very seldom ventured to make the remark to captain savage but to the first lieutenant he did very often you've been as close to it as possible sir i do assure you although you find fault but twenty seven thousand six hundred seventy two years ago you were first lieutenant of this ship and i was carpenter although we recollect nothing about it and twenty seven thousand six hundred seventy two years hence we shall both be standing by this boat talking about the repairs as we are now i do not doubt it mr muddle replied the first lieutenant i dare say that it all is very true but the repairs must be finished this night and twenty seven thousand six hundred and seventy two years hence you will have the order just as positive as you have it now so let it be done but the boatswain was a more amusing personage he was considered to be the toughest that is the most active and severe boatswain in the service he went by the name of gentleman chucks the latter was his surname he appeared to have received half an education sometimes his language was for a few sentences remarkably well chosen but all of a sudden he would break down at a hard word but i shall be able to let the reader into more of his history as i go on with my adventures he had a very handsome person inclined to be stout keen eyes and hair curling in ringlets he held his head up and strutted as he walked he declared that an officer should look like an officer and comport himself accordingly in his person he was very clean wore rings on his great fingers and a large frill to his bosom which stuck out like the back fin of a perch and the collar of his shirt was always pulled up to a level with his cheekbones he never appeared on deck without his persuader which was three rattans twisted into one like a cable sometimes he called it his order of the bath or his trio juncto in uno and this persuader was seldom idle he attempted to be very polite even when addressing the common seamen and certainly he always commenced his observations to them in a very gracious manner but as he continued he became less choice in his phraseology as a specimen of them he would say to the man on the forecastle allow me to observe my dear man in the most delicate way in the world that you are spilling that tar upon the deck a deck sir if i may venture to make the observation i had the duty of seeing hollystone this morning you understand me sir you have defiled his majesty's forecastle i must do my duty sir if you neglect yours so take that and that and that thrashing the man with his rattan you damned haymaking son of a sea cook do it again damn your eyes and i'll cut your liver out the master was the officer who had charge of the watch to which i was stationed he was a very rough sailor who had been brought up in the merchant service not much of a gentleman in his appearance very good-tempered and very fond of grog he always quarrelled with the boatswain and declared that the service was going to the devil now that warrant officers put on white shirts and wore frills to them but the boatswain did not care for him he knew his duty he did his duty and if the captain was satisfied he said that the whole ship's company might grumble the master was very kind to me and used to send me down to my hammock before my watch was half over until that time i walked the deck with o'brien who is a very pleasant companion and taught me everything that he could connected with my profession one night when he had the middle watch i told him i should like very much if he would give me the history of his life that i will my honey replied he all that i can remember of it though i have no doubt but that i have forgotten the best part of it 
it's now within five minutes of two bells so we'll heave the log and mark the board and then i'll spin you a yarn which will keep us both from going to sleep o'brien reported the rate of sailing to the master marked it down on the log board and then returned so now my boy i'll come to an anchor on the topsail halyard rack and you may squeeze your thread paper little carcass under my lee and then i'll tell you all about it first and foremost you must know that i am descended from the great o'brien boru who was a king in his time but that time's past i suppose as the world turns round my children's children's posterity may be kings again although there seems but little chance of it just now but there's ups and downs on a grand scale as well as in a man's own history and the wheel of fortune keeps turning for the comfort of those who are at the lowest spoke as i may be just now to cut the story a little shorter i skipped down to my great-grandfather who lived like a real gentleman as he was upon his ten thousand a year at last he died and eight thousand of the ten was buried with him my grandfather followed his father all in good course of time and only left me father about one hundred acres of bog to keep up the dignity of the family i am the youngest of ten and devil a copper have i but my pay or am i likely to have you may talk about descent but a more descendant family than mine was never in existence for here i am with twenty-five pounds a year and a half pay of nothing a day and find myself when my great ancestor did just what he pleased with all ireland and everybody in it father mcgrath the priest who lived with my father taught me the elements as they call them i thought i had enough of the elements then but i've seen a deal more of them since terence says my father to me one day what do you mean to do to get my dinner sure replied i for i was not a little hungry and so you shall to-day my vorneen replied my father but in future you must do something to get your own dinner there's not pretty easy now for the whole of you will you go to the say i'll just step down and look at it says i for we lived but sixteen irish miles from the coast so when i had finished my meal which did not take long for want of ammunition i trotted down to the cove to see what a ship might be like and i happened upon a large one sure enough for there lay a three-decker with an admiral's flag at the fore maybe you'll be so civil as to tell me what ship that is said i to a sailor on the pier it's the queen charlotte replied he of one hundred and twenty guns now when i looked at her size and compared her with all the little smacks and hoys lying about her i very naturally asked how old she was he replied that she was no more than three years old but three years old thought i to myself it's a fine vessel you'll be when you come of age if you grow at that rate you'll be as tall as the top of bencro thus a mountain we have in the art parts i went back to my father and told him all i had seen and he replied that if i liked it i might be a midshipman on board of her with nine hundred men under my command he forgot to say how many i should have over me but i found that out afterwards i agreed and my father ordered his pony and went to the lord lieutenant for he had interest enough for that the lord lieutenant spoke to the admiral who was staying at the palace and i was ordered on board as a midshipman my father fitted me out pretty handsomely telling all the tradesmen that their bills should be paid with my first prize money and thus by promises and blarney he got credit for all i wanted at last all was ready father mcgrath gave me his blessing and told me that if i died like an o'brien he would say a power of basses for the good of my soul so after a deal of bother i was fairly on board and i parted company with my chest for i stayed on deck and that went down below i stared about with all my eyes for some time when who should be coming off but the captain and the officers were ordered on deck to receive him i wanted to have a quiet survey of him so i took up my station on one of the guns that i might examine him at my leisure the boatswain whistled the marines presented arms and the officers all took off their hats as the captain came on deck and then the guard was dismissed and they all walked about the deck as before but i found it very pleasant to be astride on the gun so i remained where i was what do you mean by that you big young scoundrel says he when he saw me it's nothing at all i mean replied i but what do you mean by calling o'brien a scoundrel who is he said the captain to the first lieutenant mr o'brien who joined the ship about an hour since don't you know better than to sit upon a gun said the captain to be sure i do replied i when there's anything better to sit upon he knows no better sir observed the first lieutenant then he must be taught replied the captain mr o'brien 
since you have perched yourself on that gun to please yourself you will now continue there for two hours to please me do you understand sir you'll ride on that gun for two hours i understand sir replied i but i'm afraid that he won't move without spurs although there's plenty of metal in him the captain turned away and laughed as he went into his cabin and all the officers laughed and i laughed too for i perceived no great hardship in sitting down an hour or two any more than i do now well i soon found that like a young bear all my troubles were to come i got into a scrape just before we left harbour it was my watch when they piped to dinner and i took the liberty to run below as my messmates had a knack of forgetting absent friends well the captain came on board and there was no side boys no side ropes and no officers to receive him he came on deck foaming with rage for his dignity was hurt and he inquired who was the midshipman of the watch mr o'brien said they all devil a bit replied i it was my forenoon watch who relieved you sir said the first lieutenant devil a soul sir replied i for they were all too busy with their pork and beef then why did you leave the deck without relief because sir my stomach would have had but little relief if i had remained captain who stood by said do you see those cross trees sir is it those little bits of wood that you mine on the top there captain yes sir now just go up there and stay until i call you down you must be brought up to your senses young man or you'll have but a little prospect in the service i've an idea that i have plenty of prospect when i get up there replied i but it's all to please you so up i went as i have many a time since and as you often will peter just to enjoy the fresh air and your own pleasant thoughts all at one and the same time the first time that i put my foot on shore was at menorca several of us went on shore and having dined upon a roast turkey stuffed with plum pudding and having drunk as much wine as would float a jolly boat we ordered donkeys to take a little equestrian exercise some went off tail on end some with their hind quarters uppermost and then the riders went off instead of the donkeys some wouldn't go off at all as for mine he would go and where the devil do you think he went why into the church where all the people were at mass poor brute was dying with thirst and smelt water as soon as he was in notwithstanding all my tugging and hauling he ran his nose into the holy water font and drank it all up they rose up from their knees and seized me calling upon all the saints in the calendar although i knew what they meant not a word of their lingo could i speak to plead for my life and i was almost torn to pieces before the priest came up perceiving the danger i was in i wiped my finger across the wet nose of the donkey crossed myself and then went down to my knees to the priests crying out culpa mia as all good catholics do though twas no fault of mine as i said before for i tried all i could and tugged at the brute till my strength was gone the priest perceived by the manner in which i crossed myself that i was a good catholic and guessed that it was all a mistake of the donkeys they ordered the crowd to be quiet and sent for an interpreter when i explained the whole story they gave me absolution for what the donkey had done and after that as it was very rare to meet an english officer who was a good christian i was in great favour during my stay at minorca and was living in plenty paying for nothing and as happy as a cricket so the jackass proved a very good friend and to reward him i hired him every day and galloped him all over the island but at last it occurred to me that i had broken my leave for i was so happy on shore that i quite forgot that i had only permission for twenty-four hours and i should not have remembered it so soon had it not been for a party of marines headed by a sergeant who took me by the collar and dragged me off my donkey i was taken on board and put under an arrest for my misconduct sail on the starboard bow cried the lookout man very well replied the master mr o'brien where's mr o'brien is it me you mind sir said o'brien walking up to the master for he had sat down so long in the top cell halyard rack that he was wedged in and could not get out immediately yes sir go forward and see what that vessel is aye aye sir said o'brien and mr simple continued the master go down and bring me up my night glass yes sir replied i i had no idea of a night glass and as i observed that about this time his servant brought him up a glass of grog i thought it very lucky that i knew what he meant take care that you don't break it mr simple oh then i'm all right thought i he means a tumbler so down i went called up the gun-room steward and desired him to give me a glass of grog for mr dole the steward tumbled out in his shirt mixed the grog and gave it to me 
and I carried it up very carefully to the quarter-deck. During my absence, the master had called the captain, and in pursuance of his orders, O'Brien had called the first lieutenant, and when I came up the ladder, they were both on deck. As I was ascending, I heard the master say, I have sent young Simple down for my night-glass, but he is so long that I suppose he has made some mistake. He's but half a fool. That I deny, replied Mr. Falcon, the first lieutenant, just as I put my foot on the quarter-deck. He's no fool. Perhaps not, replied the master. Oh, here he is. What made you so long, Mr. Simple? Where is my night-glass? Here it is, sir, replied I, handing him the tumbler of grog. I told the steward to make it stiff. The captain and the first lieutenant burst into a laugh for Mr. Doble was known to be very fond of grog. The former walked aft to conceal his mirth, but the latter remained. Mr. Doble was in a great rage. "'Did I not say that the boy was half a fool?' cried he to the first lieutenant. "'At all events, I'll not allow that he has proved himself so in this instance,' replied Mr. Falcon, "'for he has hit the right nail on the head.' Then the first lieutenant joined the captain, and they both went off laughing. "'Put it on the capstan, sir!' said mr doble to me in an angry voice i'll punish you by and by i was very much astonished i hardly knew whether i had done right or wrong at all events thought i to myself i did for the best so i put it on the capstan and walked to my own side of the deck the captain and first lieutenant then went below and o'brien came aft i told him what had occurred and how the master was angry with me o'brien laughed very heartily and told me to never mind but to keep in the lee scuppers and watch him. A glass of grog is a bait that he'll play round till he gorges. When you see it to his lips, go up to him boldly and ask his pardon. If you have offended him, and then, if he's a good Christian, as I believe him to be, he'll not refuse it. I thought this was very good advice, and I waited under the bulwark on the lee side. I observed that the master made shorter and shorter turns every time, till at last he stopped at the capstan and looked at the grog. He waited about half a minute, and then he took up the tumbler and drank about half of it. It was very strong, and he stopped to take breath. I thought that this was the right time, and I went up to him. The tumbler was again to his lips, and before he saw me I said, I hope, sir, you'll forgive me. I never heard of a night telescope, and knowing that you had walked so long, I thought you were tired and wanted something to drink to refresh you. Well, Mr. Shimple, said he, after he had finished the glass, with a deep sigh of pleasure, as you meant kindly, I shall let you off this time. But recollect that whenever you bring me a glass of grog again, it must not be in the presence of the captain or first lieutenant. At last our watch was over, and about two bells I was relieved by the midshipman of the next watch. It is very unfair not to relieve in time, but if I said a word, I was certain to be thrashed the next day upon some pretense or another. On the other hand, the midshipman whom I relieved was also much bigger than I was and if I was not up before one bell, I was cut down and thrashed by him, so that between the two I kept much more than my share of the watch, except when the master sent me to bed before it was over. End of chapter 12please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter 13. The first lieutenant prescribes for one of his patients, his prescriptions consisting of drafts only. O'Brien finishes the history of his life, in which the proverb of the more the merrier is sadly disproved. Shipping a new pair of boots causes the unshipping of their owner. Walking home after a ball, O'Brien meets with an accident. The next morning I was on deck at seven bells, to see the hammock stowed, and when I was witness to Mr. Falcon, the first lieutenant, having recourse to one of his remedies to cure a mizzen-top boy of smoking, a practice to which he had a great aversion. He never interfered with the men smoking in the galley or chewing tobacco, but he prevented the boys, that is, lads under twenty or thereabouts, from indulging in the habit too early. The first lieutenant smelt the tobacco as the boy passed him on the quarter-deck. "'Why, Neil, you have been smoking,' said the first lieutenant. "'I thought you were aware that I did not permit such lads as you to use tobacco.' "'If you please, sir,' replied the mizzen-top boy, touching his hat. "'Or he's got worms, and they say that smoking be good for them.' "'Good for them?' said the first lieutenant. "'Yes, very good for them, but very bad for you. "'Why, my good fellow, 
they'll thrive upon tobacco until they grow as large as conger eels heat is what the worms are fond of but cold cold will kill them now i'll cure you quartermaster come here walk this boy up and down the weather gangway and every time you get forward abreast of the main tack block put his mouth to the windward squeeze him sharp by the nape of the neck until he opens his mouth wide and there keep him and let the cold air blow down his throat while you count ten then walk him aft and when you are forward again proceed as before cold kills worms my poor boy not tobacco i wonder that you are not dead by this time a few nights afterwards when we had the middle watch o'brien proceeded with this story where was it that i left off you left off at the time that you were taken out of confinement so i did sure enough and it was with no good will that i went to my duty however as there was no help for it i walked up and down the deck as before with my hands in my pockets thinking of old ireland and my great ancestor brian boru and so i went on behaving myself like a real gentleman and getting into no more scrapes until the fleet put into cove of cork and i found myself within a few miles of my father's house you may suppose that the anchor had hardly kissed the mud before i went to the first lieutenant and asked leave to go on shore now the first lieutenant was not in the sweetest of tempers seeing as how the captain had been hauling him over the coals for not carrying on the duty according to his satisfaction so he answered me very gruffly that i should not leave the ship oh bother said i to myself this will never do so i walked up to the captain and touching my hat reminded him that i had a father and a mother and a pretty sprinkling of brothers and sisters who were dying to see me and that i hoped that he would give me leave x the first lieutenant said he turning away i have sir replied i and he says that the devil a bit shall i put my foot on shore have you any fault to find with mr o'brien said the captain to the first lieutenant as he came aft no more than i have with midshipmen in general but i believe it is not the custom for officers to ask leave to go on shore before the sails are furled and the yards squared very true replied the captain therefore mr o'brien you must wait until the watch is called and then if you ask the first lieutenant i have no doubt but you will have leave granted to you to go and see your friends i thought myself very clever in this business but i was never a greater fool in my life for there is no such hurry to have gone on shore and the first lieutenant never forgave me for appealing to the captain but of that by and by and all in good time at last i obtained a grumbling assent to my going on shore and off i went like a skyrocket being in a desperate hurry i hired a jaunting car to take me to my father's house is it the o'brien of ballyhinch that you mean inquired the spalpeen who drove the horse sure it is replied i and how is he and all the noble family of the o'briens all well enough battened the boy tim who caught a bit of confusion in his head the other night at the fair and now lies at home in bed quite insensible to mate or drink but the doctors give hopes of his recovery as all the o'briens are known to have such thick heads what do mean by that bad manners to you said i but poor tim how did it happen was there a fight not much of a fight only a bit of a scrummage three crowners inquests no more but you are not going the straight road you thief said i seeing that he had turned off to the left is your honour in a hurry to get home then i'll be thinking they'll not be in such a hurry to see you and who told you that my name was o'brien you baste and do you dare to say that my friends won't be glad to see me place your honour it's all an idea of mine so say no more about it only this i know father mcgrath who gives me absolution told me the other day that i ought to pay him and not run in debt and then run away like terence o'brien who went to say without paying for his shirts and his shoes and his stockings nor anything else and who would live to be hanged as sure as st patrick swam over the leafy with his head under his arm bad luck to that father mcgrath cried i devil burn me but i'll be revenged upon him by that time we had arrived at the door of my father's house i paid the robbery and in i popped there was my father and mother and all my brothers and sisters that and tim who was in bed sure enough and died next day and that based father mcgrath to boot when my mother saw me she ran to me and hugged me as she wept on my neck and then she wiped her eyes and sat down again but nobody else said how do you do or opened their mouths to me i said to myself sure there's some trifling mistake here but i held my tongue at last they all opened their mouths with a vengeance my father commenced aren't it you shamed yourself terence o'brien aren't it you shamed on yourself terence o'brien cried father mcgrath 
are not you ashamed on yourself cried out all my brothers and sisters in full chorus whilst my poor mother put her apron to her eyes and said nothing the devil a bit for myself but very much ashamed for you all replied i to treat me in this manner what's the meaning of all this haven't they seized my two cows to pay for your toggery your spalpeen cried my father haven't they taken the hay to pay for your shoes and stockings cried father mcgrath haven't they taken the pig to pay for that ugly hat of yours cried my eldest sister and haven't they taken my hens to pay for that dirk of yours cried another and all our best furniture to pay for your white shirts and black cravats cried murdoch my brother and haven't we been starved to death ever since cried they all oh hon said my mother the devil they have said i when they'd all done sure i'm sorry enough but it's no fault o mine father didn't you send me to say yes you reparee but didn't you promise or didn't i promise for you which is all one and the same thing that you'd pay it all back with your praise money and where is it answer that terence o'brien where is it father i'll tell you it's where next christmas is coming but not come yet terence o'brien said father mcgrath it's absolution that you'll be wanting to-morrow after all your sins and enormities and devil a bit shall you have take that now father mcgrath replied i very angrily it's no absolution that i'll want from you anyhow take that now then you have had your share of heaven for i'll keep you out of it you wicked monster said father mcgrath take that now he was no better than a midshipman's berth replied i i'd just as soon stay out but i'll creep in in spite of you take that now father mcgrath and who is to save your soul and send you to heaven if i don't you wicked wet child see you damn first so take that now terence o'brien then i'll turn protestant and damn the pope take that now father mcgrath at this last broadside of mine my father and all my brothers and sisters raised a cry of horror and my mother burst into tears father mcgrath seized hold of the pot of holy water and dipping in the little whisk began to sprinkle the room saying a latin prayer while they all went on squalling at me at last my father seized the stool which he had been seated upon and threw it at my head i dodged and it knocked down father mcgrath who had just walked behind me in full song i knew that it was all over after that so i sprang over his carcass and gained the door good morning to you all and better manners to you next time we meet cried i and off i set as fast as i could for the ship i was very sorry for what i had said to the priest for my conscience thumped me very hard at having even pretended that i'd turn protestant which i never intended to do nor never will but live and die a good catholic as all my posterity have done before me and as i trust all my ancestors will for generations to come well i arrived on board and the first lieutenant was very savage i hoped he would get over it but he never did and he continued to treat me so ill that i determined to quit the ship which i did as soon as we arrived in Cossand bay the captain allowed me to go for i told him the whole truth of the matter and he saw that it was true so he recommended me to the captain of a jackass frigate who was in want of midshipmen what do you mean by a jackass frigate i inquired i mean one of your twenty-eight gunships so called because there is as much difference between them and a real frigate like the one we are sailing in as there is between a donkey and a racehorse well the ship was no sooner brought down to the dockyard to have her ballast taken in than our captain came down to her a little thin spare man but a man of weight nevertheless for he brought a great pair of scales with him and weighing everything that was put on board i forgot his real name but the sailors christened him captain avoir du Poix. he had a large book and in it he inserted the weight of the ballast and of the shot water provisions coals standing and running rigging cables and everything else but i didn't remain long for one day i brought on board a pair of new boots which i forgot to report that they might be put into the scales which swung on the gangway and whether the captain thought that they would sink his ship or for what i cannot tell but he ordered me to quit her immediately so there i was adrift again one day i was in the dockyard looking at a two-decker in the basin just brought forward for service and i inquired who was to be the captain they told me that his name was o'connor then he's a countryman of mine thought i and i'll try my luck so i called at good's hotel where he was lodging and requested to speak with him i was admitted and told him with my best bow that i had come as a volunteer for a ship and that my name was o'brien as it happened he had some vacancies and liking my brogue he asked me in what ships i had served i told him 
and also my reason for quitting my last, which was because I was turned out of it. I explained the story of the boots, and he made inquiries, and found that it was all true, and then he gave me a vacancy as master's mate. We were ordered to South America, and the trade winds took us there in a jiffy. I liked my captain and officers very much, and what was better, we took some good prizes. But somehow or other, I never had the luck to remain long in one ship, and that by no fault of mine, at least not in this instance. All went on as smooth as possible until one day the captain took us on shore to a ball at one of the peaceable districts. We had a very merry night of it, but as luck would have it, I had the morning watch to keep and see the decks cleaned, and as I never neglected my duty, I set off about three o'clock in the morning, just at break of day, to go on board of the ship. I was walking along the sands, thinking of the pretty girl I'd been dancing with, and had got about halfway to the ship, when three rapparees of Spanish soldiers come from behind a rock and attacked me with their swords and bayonets. I had only my dirk, but I was not to be run through for nothing, so I fought them as long as I could. I finished one fellow, but at last they finished me, for a bayonet passed through my body, and I forgot all about it. Well, it appears, for I can only say to the best of my knowledge and belief that after they had killed me, they stripped me naked and buried me in the sand, carrying away within the body of their comrade, so there I was, dead and buried. But, O'Brien, said I, whist, hold your tongue, you've not heard the end of it. Well, I had been buried about an hour, but not very deep, it appears, for they were in too great a hurry, when a fisherman and his daughter came along the beach, on their way to their boat. And the daughter, God bless her, did me the favour to tread on my nose. It was clear that she had never trod upon an Irishman's nose before, for it surprised her, and she looked down to see what was there, and not seeing anything, she tried it again with her foot, and then she scraped off the sand and discovered my pretty face. I was quite warm and still breathing, for the sand had stopped the blood, and prevented my bleeding to death. The fisherman pulled me out and took me on his back to the house, where the captain and officers were still dancing. When he brought me in, there was a great cry from the ladies, not because I was murdered, for they are used to it in those countries, but because I was naked, which they considered a much more serious affair. I was put to bed, and a boat dispatched on board for our doctor, and in a few hours I was able to speak and tell them how it happened. But I was too ill to move when the ship sailed, which she was obliged to do in a day or two afterwards. So the captain made out my discharge and left me there. The family were French, and I remained with them for six months before I could obtain a passage home, during which I learnt their language and a very fair allowance of Spanish to boot. When I arrived in England, I found that the prizes had been sold, and that the money was ready for distribution. I produced my certificate and received a hundred and sixty-seven pounds for my share. So it's come at last, thought I. I had never had such a handful of money in my life. I thought of my mother and of the cows, and the pig and the furniture all gone, and of my brothers and sisters, wanton pratties, and I made a vow that I'd send every farthing of it to them after which Father McGrath would no longer think of not giving me absolution. So I sent them every doit, only reserving for myself the pay which I had received, amounting to about thirty pounds. And I never felt more happy in my life than when it was safe in the post office and fairly out of my hands. I wrote a bit of a letter to my father at the time, which was to this purpose. Honoured Father, since our last pleasant meeting, at which you threw the stool at my head, missing the pigeon and hitting the crow, I have been dead and buried, but am now quite well, thank God, and want no absolution from Father McGrath. Bad luck to him. And what's more to the point, I have just received a batch of prize money, the first I have handled since I have served His Majesty, and every farthing of which I now send to you, that you may get back your old cows and a pig, and all the rest of the articles seized to pay for my fitting out. I am a true O'Brien. Tell my mother, and don't mind to turn Protestant, but uphold the religion of my country although the devil may take Father McGrath and his holy water to boot. I shan't come and see you, as perhaps you may have another stool ready for my head, and may take better aim next time. So no more at present from your affectionate son, Terence O'Brien. About three weeks afterwards I received a letter from my father, telling me that I was a real O'Brien, and that if any one dared hint to the contrary, he would break every bone in his body that they had received the money, and thanked me for a real gentleman as I was that I should have the best stool in the house next time I came, not for my head, but for my tail, that Father McGrath sent me his blessing and had given me absolution for all I had done, or should do for the next ten years to come, 
and my mother had cried with joy at my dutiful behaviour and that all my brothers and sisters bat and tim who had died the day after i left them wished me good luck and plenty more prize money to send home to them this was all very pleasant and i had nothing left on my mind but to get another ship so i went to the port admiral and told him how it was that i left my last and he said that being dead and buried was quite sufficient reason for any one leaving his ship and that he would procure me another now that i had come to life again i was sent on board of the guard ship where i remained about ten days and then was sent round to join this frigate and so my story's ended and there's eight bells striking so the watch is ended too End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter fourteen the first lieutenant has more patience mr trucks the boatswain lets me into the secret of his gentility before i proceed with my narrative i wish to explain to the reader that my history was not written in after-life when i had obtained a greater knowledge of the world when i first went to sea i promised my mother that i would keep a journal of what had passed with my reflections upon it to this promise i rigidly adhered and since i have been my own master these journals have remained in my possession in writing therefore the early part of my adventures everything is stated as it was impressed upon my mind at the time we had now been cruising for six weeks and i found that my profession was much more agreeable than i had anticipated my desire to please was taken for the deed and although i occasionally made a blunder yet the captain and first lieutenant seemed to think that i was attentive to my duty to the best of my ability and only smiled at my mistakes the first lieutenant was one of the most amusing men i ever knew yet he never relaxed from the discipline of the service or took the least liberty with either his superiors or inferiors his humour was principally shown in his various modes of punishment and however severe the punishment was to the party the manner of inflicting it was invariably a source of amusement to the remainder of the ship's company i often thought that although no individual liked being punished yet that all the ship's company were quite pleased when a punishment took place he was very particular about his decks they were always as white as snow and nothing displeased him so much as their being soiled it was for that reason that he had such an objection to the use of tobacco there were spitting-pans placed in different parts of the decks for the use of the men that they might not dirty the planks with the tobacco juice sometimes a man in a hurry forgot to use these pans but as the mess to which the stain might be opposite had their grog stopped if the party were not found out they took good care not only to keep a lookout but to inform against the offender now the punishment for the offence was as follows the man's hands were tied behind his back and a large tin spitting-box fixed to his chest by a strap over the shoulders all the other boxes on the lower deck were taken away and he was obliged to walk there ready to attend the summons of any man who might wish to empty his mouth of the tobacco juice the other men were so pleased at the fancy that they spat twice as much as before for the pleasure of making him run about i was much amused one morning watch that i kept we were stowing the hammocks in the quarter-deck nettings when one of the boys came up with his hammock on his shoulder and as he passed the first lieutenant the latter perceived that he had a quid of tobacco in his cheek what have you got there my good lad a gum boil your cheek is very much swelled no sir replied the boy there's nothing at all the matter oh there must be it's a bad tooth then open your mouth and let me see very reluctantly the boy opened his mouth and discovered a large roll of tobacco leaf i see i see said the first lieutenant your mouth wants overhauling and your teeth cleaning i wish we had a dentist on board but as we have not i will operate as well as i can send the armourer up here with his tongs when the armourer made his appearance the boy was made to open his mouth while the chaw of tobacco was extracted with his rough instrument there now said the first lieutenant i am sure that you must feel better already you never could have had any appetite now captain of the afterguard bring a piece of old canvas and some sand here and clean his teeth nicely the captain of the afterguard came forward and putting the boy's head between his knees scrubbed his teeth well with the sand and canvas for two or three minutes there that will do said the first lieutenant now my little fellow your mouth is nice and clean and you'll enjoy your breakfast 
it was impossible for you to have eaten anything with your mouth in such a nasty state when it's dirty again come to me and i'll be your dentist one day i was on the forecastle with mr chucks the boatswain who was very kind to me he had been showing me how to make the various knots and bends of rope which are used in our service i am afraid that i was very stupid but he showed me over and over again until i learnt how to make them amongst others he taught me a fisherman's bend which he pronounced to be the king of all knots and mr Shample, continued he there's a moral in that knot you observe that when the parts are drawn the right way and together the more you pull the faster they hold and the more impossible to untie them but see by hauling them apart how a little difference they pull the other way immediately disunites them and then how easy they cast off in a moment that points out the necessity of pulling together in this world mr simple when we wish to hold on and that's a piece of philosophy worth all the twenty-six thousand and odd years of my friend the carpenter which leads to nothing but a brown study when he ought to be attended to his duty very true mr chucks you are the better philosopher of the two i am better educated mr simple and i trust more of a gentleman i consider a gentleman to be to a certain degree a philosopher for very often he is obliged to support his character as such to put up with what another person may very properly fly in a passion about i think coolness is the great characteristic of a gentleman in the service mr Shimple, one is obliged to appear angry without indulging sentiment i can assure you that i never lose my temper even when i use my rattan why then mr chucks do you swear so much at the men surely that is not gentlemanly most certainly not sir but i must defend myself by observing the very artificial state in which we live on board of a man-of-war nothing would afford me more pleasure than to be able to carry on the duty as a gentleman but that's impossible i really cannot see why perhaps then mr simple you will explain to me why the captain and first lieutenant swear that i do not pretend to answer but they only do so upon an emergency exactly so but sir their emergency is my daily and hourly duty in the continual working of the ship i am answerable for all that goes amiss the life of a boatswain is the life of emergency therefore i swear i still cannot allow it to be requisite and certainly it is sinful excuse me my dear sir it is absolutely requisite and not at all sinful there is one language for the pulpit and another for on board ship and in either situation a man must make use of those terms most likely to produce the necessary effect upon his listeners certainly it is that common parlancy won't do with a common seaman it is not here as in the scriptures do this and he doeth it by the by that chap must have had his soldiers in tight order but it is do this damn your eyes and then it is done directly the order to do just carries the weight of a cannon shot but at once the propelling power the dam is the gunpowder which sets it flying in the execution of its duty do you comprehend me mr simple i perfectly understand you mr chucks and i cannot help remarking and that without flattery that you are very different from the rest of the warrant officers where did you receive your education mr simple i am here a boatswain with a clean shirt and i say it myself and no one dare gainsay it also with a thorough knowledge of my duty but although i do not say that i ever was better off i can say this that i've been in the best society in the company of lords and ladies i once dined with your grandfather that's more than i ever did for he never asked me nor took the least notice of me replied i what i state is true i did not know that he was your grandfather until yesterday when i was talking with mr o'brien but i perfectly recollect him although i was very young at that time now mr simple if you will promise me as a gentleman and i know you are one that you will not repeat what i tell you then i'll let you into the history of my life mr chucks as i am a gentleman i never will divulge it until you are dead and buried and not then if you do not wish it mr chucks then sat down upon the fore end of the booms by the funnel and i took my place by his side when he commenced as follows my father was a boatswain before me one of the old school rough as a bear and drunken as a gosport fiddler my mother was my mother and i shall say no more my father was invalided for harbour duty after a life of intoxication and died shortly afterwards in the meantime i had been by the kindness of the port admiral's wife educated at a foundation school 
I was thirteen when my father died, and my mother, not knowing what to do with me, wished to bind me apprentice to a merchant vessel. But this I refused, and after six months quarrelling on the subject, I decided the point by volunteering in the Narcissus frigate. I believe that my gentlemanly ideas were innate, Mr. Simple. I never as a child could bear the idea of the merchant service. After I had been a week on board, I was appointed servant to the purser, where I gave such satisfaction by my alertness and dexterity that the first lieutenant took me away from the purser to attend upon himself. It so happened that after I had served the first lieutenant for about a year, a young lord, I must not mention his name, Mr. Simple, was sent to sea by his friends, or by his own choice, I don't know which, but I was told that his uncle, who was executive and had an interest in his death, persuaded him to go a lord at that period some twenty-five years ago was a rarity in the service and they used to salute him when he came on board the consequence was that the young lord must have a servant to himself although all the rest of the midshipmen had but one servant between them the captain inquired who was the best boy in the ship and the purser to whom he appealed recommended me accordingly i was immediately surrendered to his lordship i had a very easy comfortable life of it i did little or nothing we went to the Mediterranean, because his lordship's mamma wished it, and we had been there about a year, when his lordship ate so many grapes that he was seized with a dysentery. He was ill for three weeks, and then he requested to be sent to Malta in a transport going to Gibraltar, or rather to the Barbary coast for bullocks. He became worse every day, and made his will, leaving me all his effects on board, which I certainly deserved for the kindness with which I had nursed him off malta we fell in with a zebek bound to civita vecchia and the captain of the transport anxious to proceed advised our going on board of her as the wind was light and contrary and these mediterranean vessels sailed better on a wind than the transport my master who was now sinking fast consented and we changed our ships the next day he died and a gale of wind came on which prevented us from gaining the port for several days and the body of his lordship not only became so offensive but affected the superstition of the catholic sailor so much that it was hove overboard the wind was still against us when a merchant vessel ran down to us that had left civita vecchia for gibraltar i desired the captain of the zebec to make a signal of distress or rather i did myself and the vessel which proved to be english bore down on us i manned the boat to go on board and the idea came into my head that although they might refuse to take me that they would not refuse a lord i put on the midshipman's uniform belonging to his lordship but then certainly belonging to me and went alongside of the merchant vessel i told them that i had left my ship for the benefit of my health and wanted a passage to gibraltar on my way home my title and immediate acceptance of the terms demanded for my passage was sufficient my property was brought from the zebec and of course as they could not speak english they could not contradict even if they suspected during my passage to gibraltar i had plenty of time for arranging my plans i hardly need say that my lord's kit was valuable and what was better they exactly fitted me i also had his watches and trinkets and many other things besides a bag of dollars however they were honestly mine the only thing that i took was his name which he had no further occasion for poor fellow but it's no use defending what was wrong it was dishonest and there's an end of it now observe mr simple how one thing leads to another i declare to you that my first idea of making use of his lordship's name was to procure a passage to gibraltar i then was undecided how to act but as i had charge of his papers and letters to his mother and guardian i think indeed i am almost sure that i should have laid aside my dignity and midshipman's dress and applied for a passage home to the commissioner of the yard but it was fated to be otherwise for the master of the transport went on shore to report and obtain pratique and he told them everywhere that the young lord was a passenger with him going to england for the benefit of his health in less than half an hour off came the commissioner's boat and another boat from the governor requesting the honour of my company and that i would take a bed at their houses during my stay what could i do i began to be frightened but i was more afraid to confess that i was an impostor for i am sure the master of the transport alone would have kicked me overboard if i had let him know that he had been so confounded polite to a ship's boy so i blushed half from modesty and half from guilt and accepted the invitation of the governor sending a polite verbal refusal to the commissioner upon the plea of there being no paper or pens on board 
well mr shimple i dressed myself very carefully put on my chains and rings and a little perfume on my handkerchief and accompanied the aide-de-camp to the governor's where i was asked after my mother lady and my uncle my guardian and a hundred other questions at first i was much confused which was attributed to bashfulness and so it was but not of the right sort but before the day was over i had been so accustomed to be called my lord and to my situation that i was quite at my ease and began to watch the motions and behaviour of the company that i might regulate my comportment by that of good society i remained at gibraltar for a fortnight and then was offered a passage in a transport ordered to portsmouth being an officer of course it was free to a certain extent on my passage to england i again made up my mind that i would put off my dress and title as soon as i could escape from observation but i was prevented as before the port admiral sent off to request the pleasure of my company to dinner i dared not refuse and there i was my lord as before courted and feasted by everybody my bill at the hotel was very extravagant and more than i could pay but the master said it was not of the least consequence that of course his lordship had not provided himself with cash just coming from foreign parts and offered to supply me with money if i required it this i will say i was honest enough to refuse i left my cards p p c as they do mr simple in all well-regulated society and set off in the mail for london where i fully resolved to drop my title and to proceed to scotland to his lordship's mother with the mournful intelligence of his death for you see mr simple no one knew that his lordship was dead when i arrived in london i still wore my midshipman's uniform i went to a hotel recommended to me as i afterwards found out the most fashionable in town and my title still following me i now determined to put off my uniform and dress in plain clothes my farce was over i went to bed that night and the next morning made my appearance in a suit of mufti making inquiry of the waiter which was the best conveyance to scotland post ye in four my lord and what time shall i order it oh replied i i am not sure that i shall go to-morrow just at this moment in came the master of the hotel with the morning post in his hand making me a low bow and pointing to the insertion of my arrival at his hotel among the fashionables this annoyed me and now that i found how difficult it was to get rid of my title i became particularly anxious to be william chucks as before before twelve o'clock three or four gentlemen were ushered into my sitting-room who observing my arrival in that damned morning post came to pay their respects and before the day was over i was invited and re-invited by a dozen people at last the play was over i had been enticed by some young men into a gambling-house where they intended to fleece me but for the first night they allowed me to win i think about three hundred pounds i was quite delighted with my success and had agreed to meet them the next evening but when i was at breakfast with my legs crossed reading the morning post who should come to see me but my guardian uncle he knew his nephew's features too well to be deceived and my not recognize him proved at once that i was an impostor you must allow me to hasten over the scene which took place the wrath of the uncle the confusion in the hotel the abuse of the waiters the police officer and being dragged into a hackney coach to bow street there i was examined and confessed all the uncle was so glad to find that his nephew was really dead that he felt no resentment toward me and as after all i had only assumed a name but had cheated nobody except the landlord at portsmouth i was sent on board the tender off the tower to be drafted into a man-of-war as for my three hundred pounds my clothes etc i never heard any more of them they were seized i presume by the landlord of the hotel for my bill and very handsomely he must have paid himself you found some difference i should think in your situation yes i did mr simple but i was much happier i could not forget the ladies and the dinners and the opera and all the delights of london beside the respect paid to my title and i often sighed for them but the police officer in bow street also came to my recollection and i shuddered at the remembrance it had however one good effect i determined to be an officer if i could and learnt my duty and worked my way up to quartermaster and thence to boatswain and i know my duty mr simple but i've been punished for my folly ever since i formed ideas above my station in life and cannot help longing to be a gentleman it's a bad thing for a man to have ideas above his station you certainly must find some difference between the company in london and that of the warrant officers it's many years back now sir but i can't get over the feeling 
I can't associate with them at all. End of chapter 14「a lee shore and a narrow escape two or three days after this conversation with mr chucks the captain ran the frigate in shore and when within five miles we discovered two vessels under the land we made all sail and chase and cut them off from escaping round a sandy point which they attempted to weather finding that they could not effect their purpose they ran on shore under a small battery of two guns which commenced firing upon us the first shot which whizzed between the masts had to me a most terrific sound but the officers and men laughed at it so of course i pretended to do the same but in reality i could see nothing to laugh at the captain ordered the starboard watch to be piped to quarters and the boats to be cleared ready for hoisting out we then anchored within a mile of the battery and returned the fire in the meantime the remainder of the ship's company hoisted out and lowered down four boats which were manned and armed to storm the battery i was very anxious to go on service and o'brien who had command of the first cutter allowed me to go with him on condition that i stowed myself away under the foresheets that the captain might not see me before the boats had shoved off this i did and was not discovered we pulled in abreast towards the battery and in less than ten minutes the boats were run on the beach and we jumped out the frenchman fired a gun at us as we pulled close to the shore and then ran away there were a few fishermen's huts close to the battery and while two of the boats went on board of the vessels to see if they could be got off the others were spiking the guns and destroying the carriages i went with o'brien to examine them they were deserted by the people as might have been supposed but there was a great quantity of fish in them apparently caught that morning o'brien pointed to a very large skate murder in irish cried he it's the very ghost of me grandmother we'll have her if it's only for the family likeness peter put your finger into the gills and drag her down to the boat i could not force my finger into the gills and as the animal appeared quite dead i hooked my finger into his mouth but i made a sad mistake for the animal was alive and immediately closed its jaws nipping my finger to the bone and holding it so tight that i could not withdraw it and the pain was too great to allow me to pull it away by main force and tear my finger which it held so fast there i was caught in a trap and made a prisoner by a flatfish fortunately i hallooed loud enough to make o'brien who was close down to the boats with a large cod under each arm turn round and come to my assistance at first he could not help me from laughing so much but at last he forced open the jaw of the fish with his cutlass and i got my finger out but very badly torn indeed i then took off my garter tied it round the tail of the skate and dragged it to the boat which was all ready to shove off my finger was very bad for three weeks and the officers laughed at me very much saying that i narrowly escaped being made a prisoner of by an old maid we continued our cruise along the coast until we had run down into the bay of arcasan where we captured two or three vessels and obliged many more to run on shore we had chased a convoy of vessels to the bottom of the bay the wind was very fresh when we hauled off after running them on shore and the surf on the beach even at that time was so great that they were certain to go to pieces before they could be got afloat again we were obliged to double reef the topsails as soon as we hauled to the wind and the weather looked very threatening in an hour afterwards the whole sky was covered with one black cloud which sank so low as nearly to touch our mastheads and a tremendous sea which appeared to have risen up almost by magic rolled in upon us setting the vessel on a dead lee shore as the night closed in it blew a dreadful gale and the ship was nearly buried with the press of canvas which she was obliged to carry for had we sea-room we should have been lying to under storm staysails but we were forced to carry on at all risks that we might claw off shore the sea broke over as we lay in the trough deluging us with water from the forecastle aft to the binnacles and very often as the ship descended with a plunge it was with such force that i really thought she would divide in half with the violence of the shock 
double breeching were rove on the guns and they were further secured with tackles and strong cleats nailed behind the trunnions for we heeled over so much when we lurched that the guns were wholly supported by the breechings and tackles and had one of them broken loose it must have burst right through the lee side of the ship and she must have foundered the captain first lieutenant and most of the officers remained on deck during the whole of the night what made it more appalling was that we were on a lee shore and the consultations of the captain and the officers and the eagerness with which they looked out for daylight told us that we had other dangers to encounter besides the storm at last the morning broke and the lookout man upon the gangway called out land on the lee beam i perceived the master dash his feet against the hammock rails as if with vexation and walk away without saying a word looking very grave up there mr wilson said the captain to the second lieutenant and see how far the land trends forward and whether you can distinguish the point the second lieutenant went up the main rigging and pointed with his hand to about two points before the beam do you see two hillocks inland yes sir replied the second lieutenant then it is so observed the captain to the master and if we weather it we shall have more sea-room keep her full and let her go through the water do you hear me quartermaster ay ay sir thus and no nearer my man ease her with a spoke or two when she sends but be careful or she'll take the wheel out of your hands it really was a very awful sight when the ship was in the trough of the sea you could distinguish nothing but a waste of tumultuous water but when she was borne up on the summit of the enormous waves you then looked down as it were upon a low sandy coast close to you and covered with foam and breakers she behaves nobly observed the captain stepping aft to the binnacle and looking at the compass if the wind does not baffle us we shall weather the captain had scarcely time to make the observation when the sail shivered and flapped like thunder up with the helm what are you about quartermaster the wind has headed us sir replied the quartermaster coolly the captain and master remained at the binnacle watching the compass and when the sails were again full she had broken off two points and the point of land was only a little on the lee bow we must wear her round mr falcon hands wear ship ready oh ready she's come up again cried the master who was at the binnacle hold fast there a minute how's her head now north northeast as she was before she broke off sir pipe belay said the captain falcon continued he if she breaks off again we may have no room to wear indeed there is so little room now that i must run the risk which cable was ranged last night the best power yes sir jump down then and see it double bitted and stoppered at thirty fathoms see it well done our lives may depend on it the ship continued to hold her course good and we were within half a mile of the point and fully expected to weather it when again the wet and heavy sails flapped in the wind and the ship broke off two points as before the officers and seamen were aghast for the ship's head was right on to the breakers luff now all you can quartermaster cried the captain send the men aft directly my lads there is no time for words i am going to club haul the ship for there is no room to wear the only chance you have of safety is to be cool watch my eye and execute my orders with precision away to your stations for tacking ship hands by the best bower anchor mr wilson at ten below with the carpenter and his mates ready to cut away the cable at the moment that i give the order silence there fore and aft quartermaster keep her full again for stays mind you ease the helm down when i tell you about a minute passed before the captain gave any further orders the ship had closed to within a quarter of a mile of the beach and the waves curled and topped around us bearing us down upon the shore which presented one continued surface of foam extending to within half a cable's length of our position at which distance the enormous waves culminated and fell with the report of thunder the captain waved his hand in silence to the quartermaster at the wheel and the helm was put down the ship turned slowly to the wind pitching and chopping as the sails were spinning she had lost her way the captain gave the order let go the anchor we will haul all at once mr falcon said the captain not a word was spoken the men went to the fore brace which had not been manned most of them knew although i did not that if the ship's head did not go round the other way we should be on shore and among the breakers in half a minute at last the ship was head to wind and the captain gave the signal the yards flew round with such a creaking noise that i thought the mass had gone over the side and the next moment the wind had caught the sails and the ship which for a moment or two had been on an even keel careened over to her gunwale with its force 
the captain who stood upon the weather hammock rails holding by the main rigging ordered the helm amidships looked full at the sails and then at the cable which grew broad upon the weather bow and held the ship from nearing the shore at last he cried cut away the cable a few strokes of the axes were heard and then the cable flew out of the hawse hole in a blaze of fire from the violence of the friction and disappeared under a huge wave which struck us on the chest tree and deluged us with water fore and aft but we were now on the other tack and the ship regained her way and we had evidently increased our distance from the land my lads said the captain to the ship's company you have behaved well and i thank you but i must tell you honestly that we have more difficulties to get through we have to weather a point of the bay on this tack mr falcon splice the main brace and call the watch how's her head quartermaster southwest by south southerly sir very well let her go through the water and the captain beckoning to the master to follow him went down into the cabin as our immediate danger was over i went down into the berth to see if i could get anything for breakfast where i found o'brien and two or three more by the powers it was as neat a thing as ever i saw done observed o'brien the slightest mistake as to time or management and at this moment the flatfish would have been dub another ugly carcasses peter you're not fond of flatfish are you my boy we may thank heaven and the captain i can tell you that my lads but now where's the chart robinson hand me down the parallel rules and the compasses peter they're in the corner of the shelf here we are now a devilish sight too near this infernal point who knows how her head is i do o'brien i heard the quartermaster tell the captain southwest by south southerly let me see continued o'brien variation two and a quarter leeway rather too large an allowance of that i'm afraid but however we'll give her two and a half points the diomede would blush to make any more under any circumstance here the compass now we'll see and o'brien advanced the parallel rule from the compass to the spot where the ship was placed on the chart bother oh you see it's as much as she'll do to weather the other point now on this tack and that's what the captain meant when he told us we had more difficulty i could have taken my bible oath that we were clear of everything if the wind held see what the distance is o'brien said robinson it was measured and proved to be thirteen miles only thirteen miles and if we do weather we shall do very well for the bay is deep beyond it's a rocky point you see just by way of variety well my lads i've a piece of comfort for you anyhow it's not long that you'll be kept in suspense for by one o'clock this day you'll either be congratulating each other upon your good luck or you'll be past praying for come put out the chart for i hate to look at melancholy prospects and steward see what you can find in the way of comfort some bread and cheese with the remains of yesterday's boiled pork were put on the table with a bottle of rum procured at the time they spliced the main brace but we were all too anxious to eat much and one by one returned on deck to see how the weather was and if the wind at all favoured us on deck the superior officers were in conversation with the captain who had expressed the same fear that o'brien had in our berth the men who knew what they had to expect for this sort of intelligence is soon communicated through a ship were assembled in knots looking very grave but at the same time not wanting in confidence they knew that they could trust to the captain as far as skill or courage could avail them and sailors are too sanguine to despair even at the last moment before twelve o'clock the rocky point which we so much dreaded was in sight broad on the lee bow and if the low sandy coast appeared terrible how much more did this even at a distance the black masses of rock covered with foam with each minute dashed up in the air higher than our low mast heads the captain eyed it for some minutes in silence as if in calculation mr falcon said he at last we must put the mainsail on her she never can bear it sir she must bear it was the reply send the men aft to the main sheet see that careful men attend the bunt lines the mainsail was set and the effect of it upon the ship was tremendous she careened over so that her lee channels were under the water and when pressed by a sea the lee side of the quarter-deck and gangway were afloat she now reminded me of a goaded and fiery horse mad with the stimulus applied not rising as before but forcing herself through whole seas and dividing the waves which poured in one continual torrent from the forecastle down upon the decks below four men were secured to the wheel the sailors were obliged to cling to prevent being washed away the ropes were thrown in confusion to leeward the shot rolled out of the lockers and every eye was fixed aloft watching the masts which were expected every moment to go over the side a heavy sea struck us on the broadside and it was some moments 
before the ship appeared to recover herself she reeled trembled and stopped her way as if it had stupefied her the first lieutenant looked at the captain as if to say this will not do it is our only chance answered the captain to the appeal that the ship went faster through the water and held a better wind was certain but just before we arrived at the point the gale increased in force if anything starts we're lost sir observed the first lieutenant again i am perfectly aware of it replied the captain in a calm tone but as i said before you must now be aware is our only chance the consequence of any carelessness or neglect in the fitting and securing of the rigging will be felt now and this danger if we escape it ought to remind us how much we have to answer for if we neglect our duty the lives of a whole ship's company may be sacrificed by the neglect or incompetence of an officer when in harbour the ship was now within two cables lengths of the rocky point some few of the men i observed to clasp their hands but most of them were silently taking off their jackets and kicking off their shoes that they might not lose a chance of escape provided the ship struck twill be touch and go indeed falcon observed the captain for i had clung to the blaying pins close to them for the last half hour that the mainsail had been set come aft you and i must take the helm we shall want nerve there and only there now the captain and first lieutenant went aft and took the four spokes of the wheel and o'brien at a sign made by the captain laid hold of the spokes behind him and old quartermaster kept his station at the fort the roaring of the sea on the rocks with the howling of the wind were dreadful but the sight was more dreadful than the noise for a few moments i shut my eyes but anxiety forced me to open them again as near as i could judge we were not twenty yards from the rocks at the time that the ship passed abreast of them we were in the midst of the foam which boiled around us and as the ship was driven near to them and careened with the wave i thought that our main yard arm would have touched the rock and at this moment a gust of wind came on which laid the ship on her beam ends and checked her progress through the water while the accumulated noise was deafening a few moments more the ship dragged on another wave dashed over her and spent itself upon the rocks while the spray was dashed back from them and returned upon the decks the main rock was within ten yards of her counter when another gust of wind laid us on our beam ends the foresail and mainsail split and were blown clean out of the bolt ropes the ship righted trembling fore and aft i looked astern the rocks were to windward on our quarter and we were safe i thought at the time that the ship relieved of her courses and again lifting over the waves was not a bad similitude of the relief felt by us all at that moment and like her we trembled as we panted with the sudden reaction and felt the removal of the intense anxiety which oppressed our breasts the captain resigned the helm and walked aft to look at the point which was now broad on the wetter quarter in a minute or two he desired mr falcon to get new sails up and bend them and then went below to his cabin i am sure it was to thank god for our deliverance i did most fervently not only then but when i went to my hammock at night we were now comparatively safe in a few hours completely so for strange to say immediately after we had weathered the rocks the gale abated and before morning we had a reef out of the topsails End of chapter 15chapter 16 of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state peter simple by frederick marriott chapter 16 news from home a fatigue party employed at gibraltar more particulars in the life of mr chucks a brush with the enemy a court martial and a lasting impression a few days afterwards a cutter joined us from plymouth with orders for the frigate to proceed forthwith to gibraltar where we should learn our destination we were all very glad of this for we had had quite enough of cruising in the bay of biscay and as we understood that we were to be stationed in the mediterranean we hoped to exchange gales of wind and severe weather for fine breezes and bright sky the cutter brought out our letters and newspapers i never felt more happy than i did when i found one put into my hands it is necessary to be far from home and friends to feel the real delight of receiving a letter i went down into the most solitary place in the steerage that i might enjoy it without interruption i cried with pleasure before i opened it 
but I cried a great deal more with grief after I had read the contents, for my eldest brother Tom was dead of a typhus fever. Poor Tom! When I called to mind what tricks he used to play on me, how he used to borrow my money and never pay me, how he used to thrash me and make me obey him, because he was my elder brother, I shed a torrent of tears at his loss, and then I reflected how miserable my poor mother must be, and I cried still more. I was very melancholy for a few days, but it was so delightful running down the Portuguese and Spanish coasts, the weather was so warm and the sea so smooth, that I am afraid I forgot my brother's death sooner than I ought to have done, that my spirits were cheered up, and the novelty of the scene prevented me from thinking. Every one was so gay and happy that I could not well be otherwise. In a fortnight we anchored in Gibraltar Bay, and the ship was stripped to refit. There was so much duty to be done that I did not like to go on shore. Indeed, Mr. Falcon had refused some of my messmates, and I thought it better not to ask, although I was very anxious to see a place which was considered so extraordinary. One afternoon I was looking over the gangway as the people were at supper, and Mr. Falcon came up to me and said, Well, Mr. Simple, what are you thinking of? I replied, touching my hat, that I was wondering how they had cut out the solid rocks into the galleries, that they must be very curious that is to say that you are very curious to see them well then since you have been very attentive to your duty and have not asked to go on shore i will give you leave to go to-morrow morning and stay till gunfire i was very much pleased at this as the officers had a general invitation to dine with the mess and all who could obtain leave requested to come i was enabled to join the party the first lieutenant had excused himself on the plea of there being so much to attend to on board but most of the gun-room officers and some of the midshipmen obtained leave we walked about the town and fortifications until dinner-time and then we proceeded to the barracks the dinner was very good and we were all very merry but after the dessert had been brought in i slipped away with a young ensign who took me all over the galleries and explained everything to me which was a much better way of employing my time than doing as the others did which the reader will acknowledge I was at the sally port before gunfire. The boat was there, but no officers made their appearance. The gun fired, the drawbridge was hauled up, and I was afraid that I should be blamed. But the boat was not ordered to shove off, as it was waiting for commissioned officers. About an hour afterwards, when it was quite dark, the sentry pointed his arms and challenged a person advancing with, Who comes there? Naval officer, junk on the wheelbarrow, was the reply in a loud singing voice, upon which the sentry recovered his arms, singing in return, pass naval officer drunk on a wheelbarrow and all's well and then appeared a soldier in his fatigue dress wheeling down the third lieutenant in a wheelbarrow so tipsy that he could not stand or speak then the sentry challenged again and the answer was another naval officer drunk on a wheelbarrow upon which the sentry replied as before pass another naval officer drunk on a wheelbarrow and all's well this was my friend o'brien almost as bad as the third lieutenant so they continued for ten minutes challenging and passing until they wheeled down the remainder of the party with the exception of the second lieutenant who walked arm in arm with the officer who brought down the order for lowering the drawbridge they were all safely put into the boat and i am glad to say the first lieutenant was in bed and did not see them the ship remained at gibraltar bay about three weeks during which time we had refitted the rigging fore and aft restowed and cleaned the hold painted the outside she never looked more beautiful than she did when in obedience to our orders we made sail to join the admiral we had very light winds and a day or two afterwards we were off valencia nearly becalmed i was on the gangway looking through a telescope at the houses and gardens round the city when mr chucks the boatswain came up to me mr simple oblige me with that glass a moment i wish to see if the building remains there which i have some reason to remember what were you ever on shore there yes i was mr simple and nearly stranded but i got off again without much damage how do you mean were you wrecked then not my ship mr simple but my peace of mind was for some time but it's many years ago when i was first made boatswain of a corvette during this conversation he was looking through the telescope yes there it is said he i have it in the field look mr simple do you see a small church with a spire of glazed tiles shining like a needle yes i do well then just above it a little to the right there's a long white house with four small windows below the grove of orange trees i see it replied i but what about that house mr chucks why thereby hangs a tale <sighs> he replied giving a sigh which raised and then lowered the frill of his shirt at least six inches 
why what is the mystery mr chucks i'll tell you mr simple with one who lived in that house i was for the first and for the last time in love indeed i should like very much to hear the story so you shall mr simple one evening i was walking in the plaza when i saw a female ahead who appeared to be the prettiest moulded little vessel that i ever cast my eyes on i followed in her wake and examined her such a clean run i never beheld so neat too in all her rigging everything so nicely stowed under hatches and then she sailed along in such a style at one moment lifting so lightly just like a frigate with her topsails on the caps that can't help going along at another time she turned a corner sharp up in the wind wake as straight as an arrow no leeway i made all sail to sheer alongside of her and went under quarter examined her close never saw such a fine swell in the counter and all so trim no ropes towing overboard well mr simple i said to myself damn it if her figurehead and bows be finished off by the same builder she's perfect so i shot ahead and yawed a little caught a peep at her through her veil and saw two black eyes as bright as beads and as large as damsons i saw quite enough and not wishing to frighten her i dropped astern shortly afterwards she altered her course steering for that white house just as she was abreast of it and i playing about the weather quarter the priest came by in procession taking the host to somebody who was dying my little frigate lowered her topgallant sails out of respect as other nations used to do and ought now and be damned to them whenever they pass the flag of old england how do you mean inquired i i mean that she spread her white handkerchief which fluttered in her hand as she went along and knelt down upon it on one knee i did the same because i was obliged to heave to to keep my station and i thought that if she saw me it would please her when she got up i was on my legs also but in my hurry i had not chosen a very clean place and i found out when i got up again that my white jean trousers were in a shocking mess the young lady turned round and seeing my misfortune laughed and then went into the white house while i stood there like a fool first looking at the door of the house and then at my trousers however i thought that i might make it the means of being acquainted with her so i went to the door and knocked an old gentleman in a large cloak who was her father came out i pointed to my trousers and requested him in spanish to allow me a little water to clean them the daughter then came from within and told her father how the accident had happened the old gentleman was surprised that an english officer was so good a christian and appeared to be pleased he asked me very politely to come in and sent an old woman for some water i observed that he was smoking a bit of paper and having very fortunately about a couple dozen of real havanas in my pocket for i never smoke anything else mr simple it being my opinion that no gentleman can i took them out and begged his acceptance of them his eyes glistened at the sight of them but he refused to take more than one however i insisted upon his taking the whole bundle telling him that i had plenty more on board reserving one for myself that i might smoke it with him he then requested me to sit down and the old woman brought some sour wine which i declared was very good although it made me quite ill afterwards he inquired of me whether i was a good christian i replied that i was i knew that he meant a catholic for they call us heretics mr simple the daughter then came in without her veil and she was perfection but i did not look at her or pay her any attention after the first salutation i was so afraid of making the old gentleman suspicious he then asked what i was what sort of officer was i captain i replied that i was not was i tenente which means lieutenant i answered that i was not again but with an air of contempt as if i was something better what was i then i did not know the spanish for boatswain and to tell the truth i was ashamed of my condition i knew that there was an officer in spain called corregidor which means a corrector in english or one who punishes now i thought that quite near enough for my purpose and i replied i was the corregidor now mr simple a corregidor in spain is a person of rank and consequence so they imagined that i must be the same and they appeared to be pleased the young lady then inquired if i was of good family whether i was a gentleman or not i replied that i hoped so i remained with them for half an hour more when my cigar was finished i then rose and thanking the old gentleman for his civility begged that i might be allowed to bring him a few more cigars and took my leave the daughter opened the street door and i could not refrain from taking her hand and kissing it where's mr chucks all the boatswain there forward hallooed out the lieutenant here i am replied mr chucks hastening aft and leaving me in his story the captain of the maintop reports the breast backstay much chafed in the serving go up and examine it said the first lieutenant yes sir replied the boatswain who immediately went up the rigging 
and mr simple attend to the men scraping the spots off the quarter-deck yes sir replied i and thus our conversation was broken up the weather changed that night and we had a succession of rain and baffling winds for six or seven days during which i had no opportunity of hearing the remainder of the boatswain's history we joined the fleet off toulon closed the admiral's ship and the captain went on board to pay his respects when he returned we found out through the first lieutenant that we were to remain with the fleet until the arrival of another frigate expected in about a fortnight and then the admiral had promised that we should have a cruise the second day after we had joined we were ordered to form part of the inshore squadron consisting of two line of battle ships and four frigates the french fleet used to come out and manoeuvre within range of their batteries or if they proceeded further from the shore they took good care that they had a leading wind to return again into port we had been inshore about a week every day running close in and counting the french fleet in the harbour to see that they were all safe and reporting it to the admiral by signal when one fine morning the whole of the french vessels were perceived to hoist their topsails and in less than an hour they were under way and came out of the harbour we were always prepared for action night and day and indeed often exchanged a shot or two with the batteries when we reconnoitred the inshore squadron could not of course cope with the whole french fleet and our own was about twelve miles in the offing but the captain of the line of battleship who commanded us hove to as if in defiance hoping to entice them further out four of the french frigates made sail towards us and hove to when within four miles three or four line of battleships followed them as if to support them our captain made signal for permission to close the enemy which was granted with our pennants and those of another frigate we immediately made all sail beat to quarters put out the fires and opened the magazines the french line of battleships perceived that only two of our frigates were sent against their four hove to at about the same distance from their frigates as our line of battleships and other frigates were from us in the meantime our main fleet continued to work inshore under a press of sail and the french main fleet also gradually approached the detached ships in about an hour we closed so near that the french frigates made sail and commenced firing we reserved our fire until within a quarter mile when we poured our broadside into the headmost frigate exchanging with her on opposite tacks the seahorse who followed also gave her a broadside in this way we exchanged broadsides with the whole four and we had the best of it they could not load so fast as we could we were both ready again for the frigates as they passed us but they were not ready with their broadside for the seahorse who followed us very closely so that they had two broadsides each and we had only four in the diomede the seahorse not having one our rigging was cut up a great deal and we had six or seven men wounded but none killed the french frigates suffered more and their admiral perceiving that they were cut up a good deal made a signal of recall in the meantime we had both tacked and were ranging up on the weather quarter of the sternmost frigate the line of battleships perceiving this ran down with the wind two points free to support their frigates and our inshore squadron made all sail to support us nearly laying up for where we were but the wind was what is called at sea a soldier's wind that is blowing so that the ships could lie either way so as to run out or into the harbour and the french frigates in obedience to their orders made sail for their fleet inshore the line of battleships coming out to support them but our captain would not give it up although we all continued to near the french line of battleships every minute we ran in with the frigates exchanging broadsides with them as fast as we could one of them lost her foretopmast and dropped astern and we hoped to cut her off but the others shortened sail to support her this continued for about twenty minutes when the french line of battleships were not more than a mile from us and our own commodore had made the signal of our recall for he thought that we should be overpowered and taken but the seahorse who saw the recall up did not repeat it and our captain was determined not to see it and ordered the signalman not to look that way the action continued two of the french frigates were cut to pieces and complete wrecks when the french line of battleships commenced firing it was then high time to be off we each of us poured in another broadside and then wore round for our own squadron which were about four miles off and rather to leeward standing in to our assistance as we wore round our main topmast which had been badly wounded fell over the side and the french perceiving this made all sail with the hope of capturing us but the seahorse remained with us and we threw up in the wind and raked them until they were within two cables lengths of us then we stood on for our own ships at last one of the line of battleships which sailed as well as the frigates came abreast of us and poured in a broadside which brought everything about our ears and i thought we must be taken but on the contrary although we lost several men the captain said to the first lieutenant now if they only wait a little longer 
they are nabbed as sure as fate just at this moment our own line of battleships opened their fire and then the tables were turned the french tacked and stood in as fast as they could followed by the inshore squadron with the exception of our ship which was too much crippled to chase them one of their frigates had taken in tow the other who had lost her topmast and our squadron came up with her very fast the english fleet were also within three miles standing in and the french fleet standing out to the assistance of the other ships which had been engaged i thought and so did everybody that there would be a general action but we were disappointed the frigate which towed the other finding that she could not escape cast her off and left her to her fate which was to haul down her colours to the commodore of the inshore squadron the chase was continued until the whole of the french vessels were close under their batteries and then our fleet returned to its station with the prize which proved to be the narcisse of thirty-six guns captain le Peloton. our captain obtained a great deal of credit for his gallant behaviour we had three men killed and robinson the midshipman and ten men wounded some of them severely about the time she was expected the frigate joined and we had permission to part company but before i proceed with the history of our cruise i shall mention the circumstances attending a court-martial which took place during the time that we were with the fleet our captain having been recalled from the inshore squadron to sit as one of the members i was the midshipman appointed to the captain's gig and remained on board of the admiral's ship during the whole of the time that the court was sitting two seamen one an englishman and the other a frenchman were tried for desertion from one of our frigates they had left their ship about three months when the frigate captured a french privateer and found them on board as part of her crew for the englishman of course there was no defence he merited the punishment of death to which he was immediately sentenced there may be some excuse for desertion when we consider that the seamen are taken into the service by force but there could be none for fighting against his country but the case of the frenchman was different he was born and bred in france had been one of the crew of the french gunboats at cadiz where he had been made a prisoner by the spaniards and expecting his throat to be cut every day he had contrived to escape on board the frigate line in the harbour and entered into our service i really believe to save his life he was nearly two years in the frigate before he could find an opportunity of deserting from her and returning to france when he joined the french privateer during the time that he was in the frigate he bore an excellent character the greatest point against him was that on his arrival at gibraltar he had been offered and received the bounty when the englishman was asked what he had to say in his defence he replied that he had been pressed out of an american ship that he was american born and that he had never taken the bounty but this was not true both the men were condemned to death and the day after the morrow was fixed for their execution i was ordered to attend the punishment on the day appointed the sun shone so brightly and the sky was so clear and the wind so gentle and mild that it appeared hardly possible that it was to be a day of such awe and misery to the two poor men or of such melancholy to the fleet in general i pulled up my boat with the others belonging to the ships of the fleet in obedience to the orders of the officers superintending close to the forechains of the ship in about half an hour afterwards the prisoners made their appearance on the scaffold the caps were pulled over their eyes and the gun fired underneath them when the smoke rolled away the englishman was swinging at the yard-arm but the frenchman was not he had made a spring when the gun fired hoping to break his neck at once and put an end to his misery but he fell on the edge of the scaffold where he lay we thought that his rope had given way and it appeared that he did the same for he made an inquiry but they returned him no answer he was kept on the scaffold during the whole hour that the englishman remained suspended his cap had been removed and he looked occasionally at his fellow sufferer when the body was lowered down he considered that his time was come and attempted to leap overboard he was restrained and led aft where his reprieve was read to him and his arms were unbound but the effect of the shock was too much for his mind he fell down in a swoon and when he recovered his senses had left him and i heard that he never recovered them but was sent home to be confined as a maniac i thought and the result proved that it was carried too far it is not the custom when a man is reprieved to tell him so until after he is on the scaffold with the intention that his awful situation at time may make a lasting impression upon him during the remainder of his life but as a foreigner he was not aware of our customs and the hour of intense feeling which he underwent was too much for his reason i must say that this circumstance was always a source of deep regret in the whole fleet and that his being a frenchman instead of an englishman increased the feeling of commiseration end of chapter sixteen
Chapter Seventeen of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Seventeen. Mr. Chuck's opinion of proper names. He finishes his Spanish talk. March of intellect among the warrant officers. We were all delighted when our signal was hoisted to part company, as we anticipated plenty of prize money under such an enterprising captain. We steered for the French coast, near to its junction with Spain, the captain having orders to intercept any convoy sent to supply the French army with stores and provisions. The day after we parted company with the fleet, Mr. Chucks finished his story. "'Where was I, Mr. Simple, when I left off?' said he, as we took a seat upon the long eighteen. You had just left the house after having told them that you were a corregidor, and had kissed the lady's hand. Very true. Well, Mr. Simple, I did not call there for two or three days afterwards. I did not like to go too soon, especially as I saw the young lady every day in the plaza. She would not speak to me, but to make use of their expression, she gave me her eyes, and sometimes a sweet smile. I recollect I was so busy looking at her one day that I tripped over my sword, and nearly fell on my nose, at which she burst out laughing. "'Your sword, Mr. Chucks? I thought bosuns never wore swords.' "'Mr. Simple, a bosun is an officer, and is entitled to a sword, as well as the captain, although we have been laughed out of it by a set of midshipman monkeys. I always wore my sword at that time, but nowadays a bosun is counted as a nobody, unless there is hard work to do, and then it's Mr. Chucks this and Mr. Chucks that.' But I'll explain to you how it is, Mr. Simple, that we boatswains have lost so much of consequence and dignity. The first lieutenants are made to do the boatswain's duty nowadays, and if they could only wind the call, they might scratch the boatswain's name off half the ship's books in His Majesty's service. But to go on with my yarn, on the fourth day, I called with my handkerchief full of cigars for the father, but he was at siesta, as they called it. The old serving woman would not let me in at first but i shoved a dollar between her skinny old fingers and that altered her note she put her old head out and looked round to see if there was anybody in the street to watch us and then she let me in and shut the door i walked into the room and found myself alone with seraphina seraphina what a fine name no name can be too fine for a pretty girl or a good frigate mr simple i was three hours with seraphina before her father came home and during that time I never was quietly at an anchor for above a minute. I was on my knees, vowing and swearing, kissing her feet, kissing her hand, till at last I got to her lips, working my way up as regularly as one who gets in at the hawse hole and crawls aft to the cabin windows. She was very kind, and she smiled and sighed and pushed me off, and squeezed my hand, and was angry, frowning till I was in despair, and then making me happy again with her melting dark eyes beaming kindly, till at last she said that she would try to love me, and asked me whether I would marry her and live in Spain. I replied that I would, and indeed I felt as if I could, only at the time the thought occurred to me where the rhino was to come from, for I could not live as her father did upon a paper cigar and a piece of melon per day. At all events, as far as words went, it was a settled thing. When her father came home, the old servant told him that I had just at that moment arrived, and that his daughter was in her own room. And so she was, for she ran away as soon as she heard her father knock. I made my bow to the old gentleman, and gave him the cigars. He was serious at first, but the sight of them put him into a good humor, and in a few minutes, Donna Serafina, they call a lady a Donna in Spain, came in, saluting me ceremoniously, as if we had not been kissing for the hour together. I did not remain long, as it was getting late, so I took a glass of the old gentleman's sour wine and walked off with a request from him to call again. Well, Mr. Simple, I met her again and again, until I was madly in love, and the father appeared to be aware of what was going on, and to have no objection. However, he sent for a priest to talk with me, and I again said that I was a good Catholic. The priest asked me whether I had confessed lately. I knew what he meant and answered that I had not. He motioned me down on my knees, but as I could not speak Spanish enough for that, 
i mumbled jumbled something or another half spanish and half english and ended with putting four dollars in his hand for carita which means charity he was satisfied at the end of my confession whatever he might have been at the beginning and gave me absolution and now sir comes the winding up of this business seraphina told me that she was going to the opera with some of her relations and asked me if i would be there that the captain of the frigate and all the other officers were going and that she wished me to go with her you see mr simple although seraphina's father was so poor that a mouse would have starved in his house still he was of good family and connected with those who were much better off he was a don himself and had fourteen or fifteen long names which i forget now i refused to go with her as i knew that the service would not permit a boatswain to sit in an opera box when the captain and first lieutenant were there i told her that i had promised to go on board to look after the men while the captain went on shore thus as you'll see mr simple making myself a man of consequence only to be mortified in the end after she had gone to the opera i was very uncomfortable i was afraid that the captain would see her and take a fancy to her i walked up and down outside until i was so full of love and jealousy that i determined to go into the pit and see what she was about i soon discovered her in a box with some other ladies and with them were my captain and first lieutenant the captain who spoke the language well was leaning over her talking and laughing and she was smiling at what he said i resolved to leave immediately lest she should see me and discover that i had told her a falsehood but they appeared so intimate that i became so jealous i could not quit the theatre at last she perceived me and beckoned her hand i looked very angry and i left the theatre cursing like a madman it appeared that she pointed me out to the captain and asked him who i was he told her my real situation on board and spoke of me with contempt she asked whether i was not a man of family at this the captain and the first lieutenant both burst out laughing and said that i was a common sailor who had been promoted to a higher rank for good behaviour not exactly an officer and anything but a gentleman in short mr simple i was blown upon and although the captain said more than was correct as i learnt afterwards through the officers still i deserved it determined to know the worst i remained outside till the opera was over when i saw her come out the captain and first lieutenant walking with the party so that i could not speak with her i walked to a posada that's an inn and drank seven bottles of risolio to keep myself quiet then i went on board and the second lieutenant who was the commanding officer put me under arrest for being intoxicated it was a week before i was released and you can't imagine what i suffered mr simple at last i obtained leave to go on shore and i went to the house to decide my fate the old woman opened the door and then calling me a thief slammed it in my face as i retreated dona seraphina came to the window and waving her hand with a contemptuous look said go and god be with you mr gentleman i returned on board in such a rage and if i could have persuaded the gunner to have given me a ball cartridge i should have shot myself through the head what made the matter worse i was laughed at by everybody in the ship for the captain and first lieutenant had made the story public well mr chucks replied i i cannot help being sorry for you although you certainly deserve to be punished for your dishonesty was that the end of the affair as far as i was concerned it was mr simple but not as respected others the captain took my place but without the knowledge of the father after all they neither had great reason to rejoice at the exchange how so mr chucks what do you mean why mr simple the captain did not make an honest woman of her as i would have done and the father discovered what was going on and one night the captain was brought on board run through the body we sailed immediately for gibraltar and it was a long while before he got round again did you ever hear any more of the young lady yes about a year afterwards i returned there in another ship she had been shut up in a convent and forced to take the veil oh mr simple if you knew how i love that girl i have never been more than polite to a woman since and she'll die a bachelor you can't think how i was capsized the other day when i looked at that house i have hardly touched beef or pork since and am in debt two quarts of rum more than my allowance we gained our station off the coast of perpignan and as soon as we made the land we were most provokingly driven off by a severe gale i am not about to make any remarks about the gale for one storm is so like another but i mention it to account for a conversation which took place and with which i was very much amused i was near to the captain when he sent for mr muddle the carpenter 
who had been up to examine the main topsail yard which had been reported as sprung well mr muddle said the captain sprung sir most decidedly but i think we'll be able to mitigate it will you be able to secure it for the present mr muddle replied the captain rather sharply we'll mitigate it sir in half an hour i wish that you would use common phrases when you speak to me mr muddle i presume by mitigate you mean to say that you can secure it do you mean so sir or do you not yes sir that is what i mean most decidedly i hope no offence captain savage but i did not intend to displease you by my language very good mr muddle replied the captain it's the first time that i have spoken to you on the subject recollect that it will be the last the first time replied the carpenter who could not forget his philosophy i beg your pardon captain savage you found just the same fault with me on this quarter-deck twenty-seven thousand six hundred and seventy-two years ago and if i did mr muddle interrupted the captain very angrily depend upon it that at the same time i ordered you to go aloft and attend to your duty instead of talking nonsense on the quarter-deck and although as you say you and i cannot recollect it if you did not obey that order instantaneously i also put you in confinement and obliged you to leave the ship as soon as she returned to port do you understand me sir i rather think sir replied the carpenter humbly touching his hat and walking to the main rigging that no such thing took place for i went up immediately as i do now and continued the carpenter who was incurable as he ascended the rigging as i shall again in another twenty seven thousand six hundred and seventy two years that man is incorrigible with his confounded nonsense observed the captain to the first lieutenant every mast in the ship would go over the side provided he could get any one to listen to his ridiculous theory he's not a bad carpenter sir replied the first lieutenant he's not rejoined the captain but there is a time for all things mr simple what are you about sir i was listening to what you said i replied touching my hat i admire your candour sir replied he but advise you to discontinue the practice walk over to leeward sir and attend to your duty when i was on the other side of the deck i looked round and saw the captain and first lieutenant both laughing End of chapter seventeen